as a church, we've been going along and reading Robert Murray McShion's Calendar of Daily Bible Readings. And in one of the four Bible reading columns that we use to get through the Bible for the whole year, we are currently in the very last chapters of Matthew. Last week, Pastor Jim uh, spoke on the parable of the evil vineyard uh, tenants and showed us how Jesus was the stone whom the builders rejected. Today, we're going to be moving forward one step in the gospel story to the key turning point which proves Jesus' parable of the vineyard owners true. This turning point is during Jesus' trial when people opt to free the murderer and insurrectionist Barabbas instead of Jesus. Let's read our main text for today, and it comes out of Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 to 24. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they then had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on his, the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. Now, let's set the stage for this shocking event. Only a little while before Jesus' trial, he rode into the city of Jerusalem like a king, receiving great fanfare from the crowds. We read this in Matthew chapter 21, verses 7 to 11. They, or the disciples, brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth, of Galilee. Now, when we read this section of scripture, it may confuse us as to how all of the sudden, in only a few short days, the people of Israel went from praising Jesus like a king to hating him so vehemently that they would rather a murderer be freed than him. It is at this point where it is important to do a short dive into the history of Israel. For I think that if we can understand the history and the culture and the times of the people that were living then, we can better glean from the scriptures and understand 
the people's motivations so that we can learn from their mistakes by identifying their misplaced values and patterns of thought. The first question that uh, should loom large in our minds about Barabbas is, is that he was a known criminal. He was a murderer. Now, Matthew, Mark, and John do not mention this, but Luke, however, uh, reveals this to us when he writes in Luke chapter 13, verses 18 to 24. And he says, But they all cried out together, Away with this man, release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they, or the crowd, was urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. So, on the one hand, we have Jesus a prophet in the eyes of many, and to his disciples, the Son of God. He fed the poor, healed the sick, cast out demons, and displayed great acts of power in front of numerous people. Even if the people did not believe that he was the Son of God and just considered him to be a prophet, by all accounts, he would have been, he would have been considered a man who was endowed with power from on high by God. Pilate even finds that there is no guilt in him that is deserving of death. Yet, the most excellent, the most pure, the most holy individual to ever walk the face of the earth is traded for an insurrectionist and a murderer. How, we must ask, did this happen? Well, firstly, we must understand the political climate of Israel at the time and know some of the reasons that the people of Jerusalem were willing to crucify Christ and commute the criminal. When we read our Bibles, we should always be hyper aware that history is not separate from the story. And if we want our study of the Bible uh, to be fruitful, and if we want to discover the motivating factors behind the characters in the Bible, it's most helpful to try to understand the historical and the cultural climate of the time. Let's turn to the Old Testament for some of the answers, all the way back to the beginning of the Second Temple Era, where Israel had just returned from captivity in Babylon and Persia. We know that the people of Israel had been rebellious to God, and that as a result, they were taken away from ca uh, to captivity by the Babylonians. And we also know that the Babylonian Empire fell in 539 BC and gave way to the Persian Empire, who was ruled by King Cyrus of the Persians. And that is what is called in modern history as the Achmedian Empire of Persia. Shortly after gaining power, King Cyrus would be moved by the Lord to fulfill the prophecy spoken by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29.10, where he said, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill you to make my promise and bring you back to this place, that is, the land of Israel. This was fulfilled in 536 BC, when Cyrus decreed that the Jews should return to their land, and that the temple of the Lord should be rebuilt. 
The leader of the returning Israelites was a direct descendant of David, or, and his name was Zerubbabel. It took seven months for the Israelites to become settled once more in the land, and as soon as they were settled, Joshua, the son of uh, Joazdak, began to build an altar in which to offer burnt sacrifices to the Lord. They prepared the offerings in the same way that the law of Moses directed them, and they celebrated uh, festivals such as the Feast of Tabernacles, and they uh, reinstituted regular sacrifices, even though the foundation of the temple had not even been laid yet. It is clear but that by these actions, the people and the leaders of Israel were eager to worship the Lord in the way that the law of Moses depicted that they should. And right after that, the foundations of the temple were laid uh, by were laid uh, by the people and the leaders of Israel. Throughout Israel's return, it is absolutely clear that the temple and reinstating proper worship to God was absolutely paramount. And it was the focal point of the entire Israelite religion. It was the central communal institution that was not just for Israel, but for all Jews all over that were scattered still amongst the nations. In this era, the temple represented hope For the Jews, it was where the people of Israel found and 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 uh, worked in their relationship with God. It was the golden ideal that they were to live up to, and that the Jews pursued. This hope, though, for the Jews, although great and although things were happening positively during the reign of the Persian Empire, um, did not mix well with. Greek culture. And in 332 BC, a power from the north quickly swept over the Persian Empire as Alexander the Great led his troops across the world. The Israelites suddenly found themselves in part of a very different empire now. And because of its rule and policies, it would cause the Israelite attitude toward their foreign rulers to change drastically. Alexander the Great was no King Cyrus. His desire was not simply to create a vast and successful empire like the Persians, but he desired to introduce and to implement Greek culture all over the then known world. He wanted the entire world to become Greek. This is what is called Hellenization. And Hellenization was the process of converting a foreign culture uh, to that of the Greeks by both force and by showing that foreign culture the the superiority of the Greeks, their gods, and their way of life. Now, this was not usually too much of an issue uh, for conquered peoples because the Greeks and their technologies brought many benefits. But the Jews, however, did not desire to become Greek or become Hellenistic. They did not want to become Greeks, and they certainly did not desire to worship the Greek gods. They were Jews, and they were the people who God called them to be. So they resisted the efforts of the Greek rulers, such as Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Now, Antiochus IV Epiphanes and other Greek rulers committed countless atrocities upon the Jewish people. And Antiochus went so far as to convert the Jewish temple in Jerusalem into a temple of Zeus, and he even sacrificed a pig on the altar in the Holy of Holies. This dark and oppressive period of the history of the Jews was remedied by what was called the Maccabean Rebellion or the Maccabean Revolt, which brought the Hasmoneans 
who were Jewish rulers back into power, but unfortunately, they became completely corrupt in their desire for power over country and governance over worship. Ultimately, the people in Israel in the end traded the Greek idolatry and persecution for corruption of the priesthood and rampant liberalism. We see this rampant corruption and liberalism show its face in the countless times where Jesus addresses the Pharisees as, as individuals such as uh, whitewashed tombs and, uh, and, and etc. Now, the Jewish ideal, or the temple, was still used in its physical form uh, to offer sacrifices to the Lord during Jesus' day. But the hope it once brought had significantly dwindled as the very men that were supposed to uphold the law of Moses broke it and used their position for personal gain. To compound these very prevalent historical issues that would have been fresh in the minds of all Israelites, after the fall of the Hasmoneans came the Romans, who taxed and ruled over the Jewish people harshly. During the period of Jesus' life, though, the imperial cult was starting to demand that the Jews would pay homage to Caesar instead of God. This, of course, brought back bitter resentment and feelings of, uh, of hatreds uh, towards the Romans, for it reminded the Jews of the oppress oppression which they had lived under during the time of the Greeks and under the rulership of people such as Antiochus IV Epip Epiphanes. Now, over the centuries, the Jewish people had started to hate all foreign powers and longed for a day when a Davidic king would once more sit on the throne and rescue, rescue the people of God from their oppression and from the rule of the iron fist which the Greek and the Romans represented. Now, if we keep this in mind, who do you think the Jews would help them achieve that freedom from the oppressive iron hand of the rulers and the state that they hated so much? Jesus, the miracle worker and the prophet, or Barabbas, the insurrectionist and the murderer? Who would be the man that would help lead them to break the chains of the Romans? The man who got things done, no matter how messy, the rebel leader, or the man who may have at times seemed a little bit soft towards violence and maybe even perceived as soft towards the Romans when he made statements such as give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God's. You see, the Jews were looking for somebody other than Jesus. To the Jews, Jesus may have been a very nice guy. He may have been a prophet, but they were looking for somebody specifically who would get his hands bloody and throw off the rope of Roman bondage. And they were searching ultimately for a political leader who who would, uh, who would ride with them into battle and reinstate the glorious kingdom of Israel that Abraham had been promised. When the Jews at that time read passages about the Savior, they tended to ignore the certain passages we often read about Jesus' death and sacrifice, such as Isaiah's passage on the suffering servant. And instead they attempted to build for themselves a vision of a savior that would save them from their physical station and circumstance, not necessarily their spiritual one. Jesus was from a Davidic line, 
And they genuinely thought the prophecies were depicting somebody from the Davidic line that would save them. They wanted Christ to be that man. But they did not understand that Christ came to win a spiritual battle and not a physical one. The people of Israel preferred Barabbas because they came to the realization that Jesus would not perform or be the type of person or leader that they wanted him to be. Instead of understanding Jesus' message and the magnitude of their fallenness and the decadence of their spiritual state, they decided to rise up their own savior that would accomplish their own own earthly desires. The zealots, in the end, started a rebellion against the Romans. And anybody that got in their way of their primary objective of throwing over the Romans was a loose end that needed to be cut. Jesus was not the only man that was, good, that was killed because of the zealots' unbridled desire to be free of foreign rule. But even those who were in no position of leadership were at times put to death by the Jews because they would not join in the fighting. Some of you may know of the fortress of Masada, where the Jewish rebellion took its last stand. Well, just prior to that last stand, the zealots had been defeated in Jerusalem, and while they were fleeing to Masada, uh, and while uh, they came across uh, several villages at its base, and they demanded to the, to the Jewish people there that those people join them in their fight for fight against Roman. But the villagers said, no, we don't want to fight against Rome. It's a lost cause. We're going to be defeated. Now, that was the wrong response for those villagers because so incensed did the rebels become that they killed every man, woman, and child in the villages. For in their eyes, the villagers were traitors and sympathizers with Rome. This was the attitude that was in the hearts of many of the Jewish people at that time. And there was this prevailing attitude amongst the zealots that said, if you are not for us, you are against us. And so Jesus, although a great man, was seen as an enemy to the Jews because he made claims such as in John uh, 18.36 where he said, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus advocated for a spiritual kingdom, one that was not of this world, and the Jews disdained him for it because he would not be the kind of savior that they wanted or desired. They did not want to be told that they were sinners, that they had to repent, and that Jesus was fighting a spiritual battle. No, instead, they were too focused on the temporary world around them. They were concerned with their life station and the oppressive Romans, and they wanted to see their desires in the here and now come to fruition. The problem is that we cannot build our own savior. We cannot make Jesus out to be who he is not. We cannot create an image of a savior that does not match up to Jesus. And if we do, we, like the Jews, must do one of two things. We must either submit to Christ and his authority or crucify him and commute a criminal to set up in place of him, or in other words, set up an idol in our lives to take place of the one true Christ. How often do we set up a false ideal or a false image of Christ so that we can 
please our own carnal desires or we can satisfy our own aims and goals. Now, we may not be in a crowd yelling, crucify him, crucify him, but we must be keenly aware of our own thoughts and motivations. Do we value success, freedom, or anything in this world more than Christ? Do we then try to twist scripture into making Jesus someone that he is not? If we do, then we create and put up a Barabbas in our minds instead of submitting to the rule of Christ. In this world, will bring us pain, and it will bring us suffering. We may lose our freedoms. We may lose everything that we hold near and dear in this world. But we must keep in mind that Jesus did not come to overthrow an oppressive Roman rule or to make our lives comfortable and carefree. He came to take those that were dead in their sins and give them life. He did not come to give us hope in this world, but rather he came so that we might be able to endure this world by giving us hope in a life to come. That is the key. This is why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50 to 58 writes, I tell you this brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the last trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable, perishable body must put on the imperishable, And this mortal body must put on immorality. When the perishable parts of the imperishable and the mortal parts put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is... And the power of sin, or or, or the, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, be always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that knowing that your labor is not in vain. So, in conclusion, who do you make Jesus out to be? Is he a means to worldly gain or comfort? Or is he the one in whom we just simply rest? He may not always take away our worldly trials, but he is the one who gives us the confidence and the hope to endure the difficulties of this world. Most of all, Jesus is the one who saved us from our sins and who took us from death and made us alive once more. He is the one who captured us from the kingdom of darkness and now has brought us in to the kingdom of light. Everything else that we have in this world, any comfort, any stability, anything good is only by product of the grace of God. And ultimately, we may fight for rights, we may fight for politics, we may fight for all these things in the world that we find near and dear, but ultimately, Jesus is concerned with the souls of men. And he came not as a conqueror to usurp the Romans or to instate the perfect Jewish rule, but instead he came 
to take a, as a suffering servant to take away your and my sin so that it would allow us to hope in something beyond this wretched world. It would allow us to hope beyond what we see in the daily and give us hope in an eternal and, and, and blissful relationship with Jesus Christ and allow us to look forward to dwelling in the eternal presence of God the Creator, God the Most High. Now, in my own flesh, I often fail to cling as closely to that hope as I should. And I'm sure that all of you do as well. This is why it is important to have an active and a living relationship with Christ. To read our Bibles and to read the words that are written in Scripture that take our eyes off this world and place them on the hope that we have in Christ and the hope that is to come. And, and, uh, and through that, we can set our eyes on, on the heavenly things. For John writes, Do not love the world or the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For All that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And with that final verse on our minds, let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word, which you have given so graciously to us. We pray that as we read the scriptures, when we come across characters such as Barabbas and ask ourselves why Israel freed him instead of Jesus, that we would also look to our own hearts and that we would search our hearts and minds for our true inner motivations. May you strengthen us so that we would have an eternal perspective of salvation that does not hope in this world, that does not place our assurance in in men like Barabbas, but instead rest chiefly on the victory of Christ over sin and the eternal inheritance that is in store for those that believe in Jesus Christ. Help us to learn to know you more and more and to continue by your spirit to give us the confidence in our faith and eternal salvation to live as those who are in the world but are not of it. And and help us to place our desires solely on those things of heaven which you have so, so graciously promised to us. Thank you for all the blessings that you have lavished upon our lives. Thank you for your word, for your salvation, and for your son. And we pray that that hope would burgeon in our hearts to the point of bursting so that all in this world that meet us and all in this world that see us would see the light of Christ shone shone through our lives. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.